I know you've been skeptical of my past life progressions, Bryce, but they were very true for me. And yeah, um, I don't know why you're judging me so harshly about this. Well, I just don't you know, believe. I, lots I, of people ordered. I just don't believe that Taco Bell ever Sorry. had fries in the 90s. I just don't believe it. Dude, you've never heard me. I don't know if you've ever heard me go on my uh, like Nachos Extreme rant of like, like there was peak Taco Bell. There was a point at which Taco Bell had like perfection. Mm. There was like the Nachos Extreme, which were like the best effing nachos ever. And then like Wild Sauce was pretty cool. Like I, I take me back to that Taco Bell city with the Mixi Melt, mm -hmm. you know, they had the Supreme and the Nachos Bel Grande. It's just. It was a, it was a different saying. time. It, it was a different time. It definitely does feel uh, just like a di who, like a different like a different place now. Who is the Elon Musk of fast food Mexican? Oh, we need that. Yeah, because because on one hand you would say like a Chipotle, maybe. No, no, no. I would not say that. <laughs> um. um I don't know. It's interesting because I feel like this, the, the answer to that question, at least in America, is, you know, find a local place, right? Find a small place. The small places will be better. Um, and so you end up with this weird ad hoc advice of the best place that you can go uh, will be different everywhere. I just... <clears throat> I, the, the Mexi Melt was one of these things that I was, uh, what is this? Do, do I want to try this? And I'm like, oh my God. And then it became my favorite. Mexi Melt became my favorite. And yeah. then they yanked it. And then there was no moss. And, and it wasn't like Taco Bell came out with anything else like super innovative after that. Right. Like the, I, and, and generally I don't like this, the specialty limited time who's it uh so they do whatever whatever their thing is where it's a burrito but then it's got a layer of nacho cheese that's all they do that is just literally the, whoever was whoever was the genius <laughs> in in the brian we're talking about whoever was the genius in the 1990s innovating for taco bell where are they now are they make are they are they at spacex is that what happened uh, are I, they I, I i am so proud that there was like, I came in mid sentence and it was gibberish. And then I heard the right words to let me know Taco Bell. They're talking about Taco Bell. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. It's, yes, it no, good. it is. It's the best. <laughs> I'm on, I'm on your team. <laughs> so uh, Rob doctor, just but the McRib, the McRib is based entirely on the price of pork futures. Right. That is how McDonald's, they have economists that plan that out. And that's when you get McRib is when they say, oh, the price of pork fell. Taco Bell had some mercurial Johnny Ive of Mexican food in the 1990s who was just creating, cranking out innovation after innovation, not just extreme, wild yeah. sauce, Mexi melts, and then gone. Do you think that person was supplanted by the genius who made the, the Doritos Locos tacos? Oh, that 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 is... That is the... That is, that is the one finding. case where I will eat all of my own words about uh, 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 dipping in, in your own swimming hole, cross-brand pollination, trying to do a clock radio thing, because that, that shit is good. Chef's kiss it's is good. the best. I, I think that was probably Mr. Dorito. <laughs> 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 He's like sitting there at Taco Bell, like, Hey, your shell sucks, sucks, sucks. Like, what are you going to do? How about a giant Dorito? Oh, where are we going to get a giant Dorito? Allow me to introduce myself, Mr. <laughs> Dorito. <laughs> it's like, oh, I don't know. Aren't you Yum Brands Incorporated? <laughs> like, that's, AKA that, Mr. Dorito. That is in, <sighs> uh, that is in network synergy uh, writ large. It's perfect. It, I, I, it, it, it turns out it can happen. Yeah. I mean, and as as did uh, you, you know what the only other example I have of it working that well 
was the time that uh, SpaceX launched a Tesla into space. <laughs> like that was that was good synergy. That was good synergy. <laughs> Did you know that they also own the Habit Burger Grill? I don't know the Habit. I don't think we have those. Down Habit's here. a really cool chain. Really good uh, burger chain. It's more a little more like uh, slightly more upscale. Not upscale, but like you go to the counter order, they bring it to you. Hmm. That's a burger place. Uh, no, I'd never heard of that. Yeah, yeah Habit's good. Huh. Yeah, I would have I a Taco Bell burger. I would have a Taco Bell burger. Well, I like to get those Jack in the Box tacos. I'm not going to lie. Oh, those are good. The little beef pockets. They're not really tacos. They're really just like deep fried dumplings. Just little meat pockets. Yeah, I'm cool. well, then okay. you get the small uh, ones. Like, re- all right. re- Real quick. Uh, we take our shared wisdom from you know Taco Bell and so on. <laughs> We create a franchise, Mm. and the name of the franchise is I'm Not Addicted, You're Addicted. Welcome to I'm Not Addicted, You're Addicted. (laughs) Can I get started for you? (laughs) Right? And it's like, uh, well, you're only addicted because it tastes so good and because it's highly addictive. (laughs) I I wanted to, (laughs) I'm going to pitch you my perfect fast food restaurant. Okay. 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 And there's only one technology that I'm just ma- missing. By the way, are, are, are we live? I, 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 yeah, we yeah. are live. This might as well be the show. Uh, it, <laughs> Arby's Everybody meets Taco Everybody has signed an NDA. Go ahead. <laughs> Arby's, Arby's meets Taco Bell. Yeah. Okay. So you got roast beef and you also got tacos. Yeah. Okay. It, the, the, the name, I'm going to use a dinosaur, a T-Rex. It could be called Rex Mex. Somebody's probably already used, but anyhow. Okay. And the whole layout would be like this sort of like uh, wild, weird West sort of layout with a cactus by like the drive through and stuff and like some animatronic dinosaur stuff. The thing is, is they need to figure out that perfect sauce that can go on a taco and on roast beef. That's what's holding me back. Other I mean, than that, Arby's, I Arby's sauce and, and, and melted cheese. Both of those. Both of those, I think, would work on both. Oh, my gosh. If they put Arby's sauce at the Taco Bell in the packets. We may have to try it. How would Worcestershire, Worcestershire, Worcestershire uh, taste on both? Or soy sauce? It'd be kind of like an au jus a bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very yeah. salty. Probably, probably pretty salty. Yeah. Probably a little tart. Some tartness. I like a little sweet and spice. Yeah, I like the sweet. Justin and I, I think we reminded you, we lived near the Arby's flagship store. And so they would do like wow. test all these different sauces and stuff there. Just throwing it out there. Okay. We're not inventing a new brand. We're inventing a new type of food. It caters to low carb uh, uh, meat eaters. We're going to invent Rex Mex. <laughs> like as in Tyrannosaurus Rex Mex. Come on. Who's with me? Let's. It already exists. <laughs> I don't know. All right, you guys want to do the show? Well, yeah. that was my name was Rex Mex. That's what I wanted to call it. But, oh, oh, you know, oh, I, I, I don't know if it yeah. actually is dinosaur. <laughs> dinosaur meat. Um, so, Andrew, I, I uh, got some stories prepped for today. I don't know if uh, uh, if you did or if you... Yeah, let's do that. I have some, but I'll just, just save for next week. Okay. Um, so let's use your stories. Perfect. That sounds good to me. All right, well, you guys want to start the show? Ready, ready. Yep. All right, then I'll uh, uh, then bring us in in three, two. Hello and welcome to the Weird Things podcast. I'm Andrew Mean, joined by Mr. Brian Brushwood. That's right. Three hosts only, as it has always been and is in our charter. And Mr. Bryce Castillo. That's right. Bryce, third host Castillo is here as always. Mm-hmm. Hi, welcome back. Three, the triumvirate, the perfect shape. The three. Uh, it's, it's it's a gentlemen. magical number. I'm not going to lie. And a triangle is such it a is. strong structure. Oh, my goodness. Can you believe it? I know. Uh, Bryce, you've got the stories yeah. today. Yeah, I've got some stories for you today. Uh, uh, the, the, the climate change. Who? The mm-hmm. climate change. Not a fan. Boy, Tough. Not boy, a fan. Oh, boy. Is it is it d- does it appear to be real? And uh, oh, if I had a time machine, I'd go back 20 years and whisper to a younger version of myself. <laughs> hey, looks like it's going to be pretty real. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I don't know that reducing carbon emissions will be the right answer, but it's going to be hot. It's going to be hot. <laughs> There's going to be one year. It's going to be really hot. Uh, so, so scientists at MIT have a proposal um, to to maybe offset some of the uh, uh, the results of climate change. Uh, do you guys remember that episode of Futurama where they're dealing with with climate change? Uh, you know what I do and Andrew does, but I'm betting somebody out there in the listening audience might have forgotten it. Uh, Remind them. Well, in, in, in Futurama, the com, the cartoon about the future, they are dealing with climate change. And one of the solutions that they propose is a big global initiative to solve climate change right now, right now, uh, is to put a big mirror in space to reflect, uh, some of the sun's. Uh, 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 light to re- stop it from reaching Earth, bringing temperatures down. Not maybe to solve climate change, but to kind of offset the rising temperatures. So uh, scientists at MIT said, yeah, what if we did that? And have suggested space bubbles uh, that we're looking at a picture of here uh, to do just that. Uh, they, these would be... They, 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 they appear to be made of mylar, I guess? Uh, yeah, they're, they're made out of a thin reflective membrane. They would have to be gigantic. They would have to be uh, the biggest thing we've ever put into space. Um, it would have to sit at about the the uh, uh, Lagrange point, uh, 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 about where the, the, the James Webb telescope is, I believe. Okay, well, opposite of that. Uh, yes. So, so, so if uh, uh, James Webb is at L2, this would be L1 between us and, and, and the sun. Uh, yes, yes, um, and it would. It, this would be thousands of miles wide, um, and it would need to stay in space. It would need to stay in the same place, and uh, to have to deal with solar winds, radiation, uh, not to mention any number of objects. Uh, and it also doesn't solve climate change. It only kind of addresses some part of it. And I, I. I like big thinking. I like big thinking. I, I, my issue with these things, like we go back to the space elevator uh, <laughs> era, is that is it you have some ideas that maybe might might be practical, but they're fantasy in the world of like the idea that we 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 can't even do an embargo on Russian oil with our partners that we're going to get together and agree upon something like this just is not going to happen. And also like the scary thing too, is like, well then what will be the consequences of this? We don't know. Like we don't know. And also that, well, great. Are parts of the world that are kind of really effing cold now going to get even more cold, which is we still lose more people to cold than to heat. And so that's a thing that kind of people, we look at one problem and forget other things like, you know, I'm not going to be pro climate change. You'll make it very clear, but climate change is a complex issue. A complex issue, and the world is greener than it was 20 years ago. This is not a this is science, it's the world is greener. Improved CO2 can be helpful, and then you can have catastrophic collapse, which that's the bad part, which that is a reality too. My I look at this and I'm like, okay, well, let's just spend that money on nuclear energy and carbon sequestration. Like that to me would be like, I think we would be way better off doing that. And I, I, I think this is conceptual. I think everyone along the line understands that there are a lot of major roadblocks to this being practical. I, sure, but I, 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 they are, and I'm sure they would develop. But I, I, my, my concern is that it's not a serious idea by people who should be taking other things more seriously. In my opinion, is that if like, I'm like, ah, climate change, therefore I'm like, what, what what about nuclear and like carbon sequestration? Like, what about these? Like, that seems to me like a really good, ah, but space bubbles, like, is that a real, cause that's going to, it's a distract. People can free to submit, suggest anything they want to me, but it's such a huge distraction because it's not a real solution. Well, what, um, what it definitely is is an immediate, uh, a, an immediately measurable, uh, temporary solution. In the way that you're on the beach, it's hot, and you grab an umbrella and put pull it over you. You have not 
affected C acidification. You have not uh, changed anything about over farming or overfishing. Mm -hmm. You have not uh, made the world a better place, but you yourself are enjoying this moment. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in that regard, I understand doing it, but, but man, uh, th there's a lot of other problems that will still need to be cleaned up. Um, uh, I, uh, I uh, yeah, I, 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 don't, I, mm. I don't know. My, my default position is, uh, the human problem solving engine seems to run very, very fast. And, uh, at some point we have to do a thing. And the perpetual question is, do we let this problem solving engine just run just a little bit longer and maybe it's got a better solution or do we do something now? And this feels like a something now solution that definitely would cool things off, but would not fix significant parts of the problem. I guess my issue is like, it's not like it's, oh, we build another ISS, which was the largest human endeavor ever at a hundred billion dollars. This is something that's going to cost tens of trillions of dollars. It's just, it's just, it's the scale like, like yeah. that. The, and so in order to do this, we're going to have to commit so much of the economic might of the planet greater than, you know, when we did Apollo, that was 25% of the national budget. Mm -hmm. Imagine what this is going to be. And like, ah, this is, I'm like, yeah. man, if you're, if you're going to start handing out money like that, which I don't advise, I've got a bunch of other things I think are probably, you know, more fruitful. I mean, well, but I, I, we all agree that this is not feasible. I, I, I think like these are MIT researchers. They're not going to, I mean, m maybe they should spend time coming up with a definitive evidence that we should switch to nuclear or to, to solar but also i think that this is a, th what else are they gonna this you got to start somewhere then i don't think that they love this idea either but they they walked it through and we see what this could look like as a beginning towards next ideas i don't think anybody is even is asking for the money for this uh, but the raft itself researchers hypothesize a craft roughly the size of brazil <laughs> Yeah, it, I, it it would have to be it would have to be very big. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about how much energy CO two will be emitted by putting that much matter into the into space. Well, I'm, I I still agree I'm, that there are problems. I, <laughs> I am now fully bought in on the paradigm of pretty soon getting to orbit will be very very cheap, if not practically free. What the moment on this show that I learned that a starship a day was being produced by SpaceX, I realized whatever happens next, uh, it, it, it happens by starry-eyed people with a few billion dollars, not trillions. Uh, and, uh, and that may involve something crazy like this. Uh, but you rightly, Andrew, pointed out that uh, the level of interglobal politicking that it will take to like, uh, if I were to guess, Russia is pretty pleased with it being a little less, you know, Russia <laughs> frozen these days. Uh, and, and so now all of a sudden you're going to put up a, a sunshade and cool off the planet. Great for the planet, not so great for one particular country on the planet, right? So um, uh, I... Oh, there was something I was leading to, and I've lost it. Uh, I'll I'll go, and then you see. Okay, go. I, my my my. There are a lot of we can ask engineers. We can come up with a thousand solutions. Some are going to be better than others. Some are going to be really bad. Uh, you know, and sometimes I watch videos where people will take down stuff, and I'll go, no, that's actually not fair, because like I you know I watch somebody do a takedown on the Team Seas project where they want to use robots to clean up the seas, and it was a really scientism sort of takedown. It was really not. It was just. I was really frustrated by watching the takedown because I'm like, you can, there may be engineering questions, but they, they, the person doing it wasn't competent enough to answer that. So he had to make this thing like, well, it's all these ocean waterways are different. There's no one size fits all. I'm like, yeah, but there are a lot of dirty waterways where this would work. And it's like, oh, we need to stop at the source. True, but this could be cleaning up bottles right now. And I'd say the difference with this is like your marginal cost on this, on a robot that goes up and picks bottles out of a waterway is effectively one person could fund that where this is, the entire global economy. Well, and and like 
I, I, I want to put this in context. Like, I don't think anyone is saying this is what All we right, should do. All right, Mr. Team do. Space Bubble, go ahead. <laughs> this isn't what we should do right now. They they, they do, uh, uh, I, I think, a point of saying that this would be an emergency solution, that 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 this is something that is in our tool belt. Maybe this doesn't work today. Maybe things get way worse, and we need to spend all of Earth's um, collective might on re building a reflective thing. Or maybe that never happens, and we don't need to think about this ever again. But I don't think that MIT is saying, this is our pitch that we should do this now. I think that this is an emergency idea yeah, yeah, the, the, should... sensible city, the sensible city lab at MIT let's put it to put a finer point on it so we're not uh yes that that yes that that yes um but, but... so so that that I think is worthy of having the perspective here yes this is wildly expensive yes this is really not going to solve really anything other than one specific problem and it will probably make some other things worse as a response and also this is something we could do and i think it's helpful to know things that we could do um so rather than not let let me toss this to the committee just 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 to speculate wildly yeah. uh, uh uh no wrong answers what is it that the world has against fifth generation fission nuclear plants like like by all accounts uh they're so safe that they run on the spent fuel from previous uh fission plants uh mm -hmm. they, they they similar to fracking uh which which took us from you know a, a, a light sweet crude to uh, uh liquid natural gas uh with with you know more than chopping off half the carbon or whatever it was a step in the right direction. Is it is it an obsession with the perfect being the enemy of the good? Is there something just inherently scary with a, a, a fission nuclear reactors? Is I, I, what, uh, 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 but I think public perception doesn't decide who makes power plants. I think people who have a lot of money and would rather their form of energy be the thing that makes money. I, I I mean I'm sure there are people who have concerns about nuclear and have whether it's safety historical what have you and also most of those people don't get to decide. I I have a I think there's so my opinion is that there's multiple factors. I, I think that doesn't really get said much, but like in the 50s and 60s, you're gonna be like, okay, Andrew's wearing his tinfoil hat, but I'm like, this is legit. The Russians spend a lot of time and energy convincing people in the West to be very critical of nuclear because they realize that having nuclear weapons was an advantage. And so when you look at like actually funding certain protest groups, things like this, you actually find out there was a lot of a lot of effort being put in by the Russians to sort of convince the West that nuclear was a bad idea to slow down the development. Um, and even it's just it's documented, it's pretty historical about that. That's part of it. Also is the idea that it is not the perfect solution. And people like in the comment, people are like, ah, oh, it produces, you know, these these dirty rods. I'm like, dig a hole. What's what we do? Like literally, that's a solved, that's a solved problem. You know, we can we've dug mine shafts that are extremely deep. We know how to deposit these things. You dig down deep enough in the earth, it's hot and radioactive anyway. So it's point to me, it's like, ah, it's it's not really that big of a project. It's aesthetically, it's unpleasant to us. Aesthetically, you know, you get people who decide, ah, oh, we we got to get rid of plastic straws, although plastic waste in the ocean just as a rule just doesn't come from here. You know, you know, like we 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 come up with these, oh, but we don't like I don't like the idea of waste. I don't like the idea of that. And I remember like people talk about like, oh, iPhones and all these, you know, these damaged iPhones. Like you could fit every iPhone ever made inside of, you know, a college gymnasium. You know, like it's it's you could put it all there. Um might have some storage issues, whatever. So I think we aesthetically get very bothered by these things. And then you know, I've talked to people who are smart, like, oh, you know, overpopulation worries me. I'm like, you ever been to Wyoming? You can drive from one end of the state and never see a person. Never see a person. Yeah, and uh, uh, for the record, uh, uh, people who are worried about overpopulation, uh, the demographers are worried about underpopulation. It's about our inability to, our fertility yeah. rates but you, going down. You, 
but you'll see these rebuttals for that go like, oh, but by the end of the 20, you know, end of the 21st century, there's going to be, you know, 10 billion people. That's a lot more. And I'm like, yes. And because I, I read an article that's kind of ridiculing Elon Musk pointing out the underpopulation is a problem. And it's like nowhere in the article do they point out what's the average age going to be at the end of the 21st century. And when the average age of the person on the planet is 45 or 46, that's not good because mm -hmm. your replacement thing just you go through that's the peak and then you go through collapse because it's so hard for people to wrap their head around the idea of you know like wait you know we're there maybe not enough people not enough growth you know i'm starting to think that this whole planet earth is a rather complex system and that there is <laughs> mm. no one simple solution to everything what if there is one simple solution at well space I mean, bubbles? there is one <laughs> simple solution to make sure that we show up ah. loud live and independent in your very own rss feed every single monday and that's to go to patreon.com slash weird things that's where you get exclusive segments where we talk about what it's like to be an independent creator where you are our actual boss and we listen to you guess right. what mr president we'll take your letter but we will not jump to action the way we will when somebody says hello one of your bosses here right. because you we'll joe biden you we'll need to be a patron we'll, before we listen to you we will solve climate change like that if if somebody besides Joe Biden on, Joe. would stop cluttering up our inbox and instead a real boss. Hey, man, come on. I just need you to do the climate change. No, man, give us Patreon money. <laughs> Patreon.com. Yeah, actually, yeah, that, that's our official position <laughs> is, is until Joe Biden becomes <laughs> a patron. I'm sorry, buddy. I can't be bothered to hear any of your nonsense. Not at all. Um, okay. I got some more stories here. If, if yeah, which yeah. one second? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I I get a veto. You You know why I get a veto? You I get a veto. Any, either of one of you? Oh, of course. Yeah. Wait. That, no, do you know why? No, I don't know why. I know it's you do. In it's the in the constitution. It's in your constitutional contract. Yeah. Because I'm a Patreon supporter of the show. Ah, uh, uh, you just figured yeah. out that we aren't even patrons. Well, I'm I'm a patron. I am I a Patreon. So I am a supporter of the show. So yeah, take as that, the Joe Biden. Speaking boss here. I'm, a, I'm also a patron. Well, Andrew, how would you <laughs> oh, like us to solve climate change? <laughs> <laughs> well, here's here's something. This is this is interesting. Um, have you thought about concrete very much? Do you guys think about concrete as a common building material? When, when I, I, do, I read this article and then I had a funny idea in my head. But yes. OK, go ahead. I, okay Brian, I don't know what the article is. OK, but I do know that you know what when I think is? of concrete. I think of the fact that one of the most outrageous sentences you can speak is humanity lost the recipe for concrete for a good couple thousand years and finally figured it out again. That is remarkable to me. But I'm, I'm, I'm going to guess that's not what this is about. N no, um, that this is this is a different thing. So th th these are uh, uh, engineers from Australia's Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology have come up with a new idea to make concrete. So concrete um, is a couple of things. It's a kind of a, a, a binding agent that's Portland cement. Thus, you add water and aggregates, so sand, rocks, gravel, other things volcanic that kind of hold it. Volcanic ash. Uh, say. <laughs> oh, uh, volcanic ash. Uh, and uh, formerly volcanic ash, which which is what made the the historical concrete so strong. Um, one of the suggestions, um, because volcanic ash, the reason we don't do volcanic ash is that volcanic ash is not available all over the world. It is very very difficult to source. Um, uh, so what if instead of rocks and gravel and this aggregate material, what if we used ground up rubber tires? Uh, Bryce. Yes. I say this with all the patience and understanding of being the father of a nine-year-old. Mm. Rubber tires rubber are not rocks. They're, they're good point. Great point. Thank you so much for that one, Brian. You're right. They are not rocks. In fact, Welcome to weird science. <laughs> Hit you with a hard fact. That's going to be the little YouTube short of a TikTok clip. Bryce, 
<laughs> Tires aren't raw. <laughs> do, 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 do. Doing the Dougie while he's doing it. Yeah, that's correct. Tire, tires are not rocks. Rubber is not exactly rocks. And in fact, at one point, um, uh, scientists had tried to create a concrete using using just rubber or a rubber alternative. And they found they actually found that it was a problem because rubber is actually porous, uh, uh, which means when you get water in there and that water dries up, it becomes brittle. It'll break. And uh, I guess they found a new method for um, casting, uh, for grinding up, for for making a ground beef out of out of used tires. Back, back to Taco Bell. <laughs> I, I, I'm with you. I'm with you. There we go. Okay. Um, you put them. Okay. They get the ground beef of the tires. They put them in a burrito of a mold. Uh, I think we've got a picture of it here. But they 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 cast it in in these kind of uh, poles here to compress it. So they do have to compress the rubber to get all of those pores out and then that seems to make a pretty strong concrete it is not um uh uh quote a reliable structural element yet uh, oh oh yeah that's all. We're, we're not gonna be making houses out of it yet but uh it does have a little more compressive strength it is a little more tensile strength just children's hospitals just children's hospitals <laughs> I mean, uh, it's not perfect, but it's interesting because you can ship rubber everywhere. There's rubber everywhere. There's you, it's very hard to get volcanic ash in Oklahoma. There's rubber everywhere. I, I, at the less. very least, there's a lot of things that are currently made out of concrete that could be made out of a little less structurally sound, a little lighter facsimile. Like, like for example, uh, uh, you know, all those all those pylons that keep people from driving into 7-Elevens or whatever. Uh, sure, make make them out of this, right? Yeah. Uh, I, to some degree. I mean, it, dep- it, it will ultimately depend on how strong this could be. And also, it's kind of, it's not easy. It's not exactly easy to make. You have to process the rubber. You have to compress it and re- reformat it, it. So there's a lot of it, usage. Yeah, I mean, maybe it just feels to me like one of these things where somebody's looking at a pile of tires and going, "Ah, oh, what could we do with that? Oh, we can make conc- we can make the most expensive unsafe concrete we have, <laughs> and that we have to wait twenty years to figure out if it's safe to use as a building material." Um, so that's why, like, well, you know, maybe we get a lot of that. Oh, we found out we can make this flex. Like, actually, the amount of concrete produced every year versus tires is substantially more. Well. Uh- let let me try to steel man this uh, effort. Steel belt it, if you will. <laughs> yeah, that was well played. Uh, but 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 uh, just as my question is, when is the time to stop thinking and stop and start acting when it comes to climate change? When is the time to start playing with ideas like this, even though they won't be profitable, they won't make sense, they're silly. You're only thinking about it because you happen to have a bunch of tires in front of you or whatever. But also you're getting rid of those tires. I mean, those tires are not exactly doing a lot of tires and rubber waste is not doing anything either. Yeah. I I would say that I think there's a lot of practical. We just talked about this before about nuclear. Like nuclear is an extremely practical. It's the safest form of energy, probably the safest form of energy production we have. Mm-hmm. And we know a lot more in 2020 than we did in 1950, although it took we we were using bad reactor design for decades because of some historical mistakes. But we know so much more now about how to build things. It, no, it won't be perfect, but will likelihood of failure. And and to me, it's like there are really good solutions right now. You know, it comes to tires and stuff. It's like, I mean, concrete. I, I think that we're going we're going to realize there's not like part of the concrete shortage has been because China has been buying up so much concrete. And also, when you talk about like uh, damages to the environment, what happens on concrete, that is huge. But we may not see that epic level of growth happen forever, and there may be a glut of concrete five years from now. Hmm. Yeah, the the part that short circuits my brain is when I think about like just how much free space we have. Uh, if if uh, I, I may be getting the statistic wrong, but I'm told that if you go and to the middle of one of the Dakotas and just carve out something the size of New York, of Manhattan, like that's where all of our waste can go and put a cap on it and just wait to solve that later for a hundred years. And it's like, so if that's true, then why bother 
thinking this way. And, and I, I don't have a good answer. Yeah, we, for that. we've land, well, it, yeah, landfills, I, I would say for a second, like landfills are incredibly complex now, but the, how far they've evolved to the point that you build parks, you build all sorts of stuff on top of in the Western world, the what, for other parts of the world, that's still a problem. And, and a part of that we need to do is distribute things that work really well here to other places you know, uh, water treatment, these things like this are critical and we take for granted that we have access to it. But like, yeah, the landfill is like, yeah, you just dig some holes, layer it, put a layer of clay on top and go on top of it. And it's, it's, it's not just, we dig, we don't just like dig a hole in the ground and just dump it in there and say, all right, F that throw, throw a match. It's, it's not what people think of when they get obsessed about waste. Yeah. Um, uh, if I could change topics here just a little bit, another story. Um, I, I don't, I, I, this is up finally, against, we're going to talk about climate change. This is up against the edge of, <laughs> of my understanding of, of, co of computer systems here. So, so this is, stick with me a little bit. Okay. Um, researchers, uh, uh, did they say where from, is this also from MIT? Oh my goodness. MIT is wiling out, uh, uh, who have suggested, um, a new type of, uh, a, resistor a new programmable resistor um these are the types that can be used in artificial intelligence processing um that they are designed to mimic in some ways the structure of the human brain um my the my high level overview of this is that they have created them with new materials that allow the protons that move across the resistor to i, I guess simulate synapses uh, can move about one million times faster along these new materials than, I guess, existing materials or existing traditional systems, which would mean uh, or could mean um, m a breakthrough in how fast artificial intelligence could uh, model the brain with these resistors. It could have an AI that can think and, pun I don't know, come up with, with many different trains of thought um, at many orders of magnitude faster, um, assuming that this works. This supposedly this would be this would fit in easily enough with current manufacturing systems that make silicone and circuit boards. Um, uh, so ideally, there's a lot of uh, of options to train artificial intelligence even faster with these new parts. So I'll give you. Can I just give a little background for a second? Yeah, please. So. One of the big leaps in artificial intelligence happened when we started throwing a lot of compute at the concept of deep learning and deep learning just taking large amounts of information and letting the computer sort of find these patterns and going over it. And this was made faster by literally the development of the GPU, the graphic processing unit, because a GPU basically takes an array of a bunch of numbers and another array of numbers and does math between them. And it's designed to be able to handle these kind of arrays of, of information, net math mathematical equations need to be solved. So it can handle them really fast, bigger than just say a CPU. Yeah. So the GPU is a big lift. Almost everything that you see now with like AI stuff uses GPUs. There's also the TPU or there's versions of that, which is a tensor processing unit, which is actually a chip designed more specifically for the tensor type uh, math that needs to be done for AI. And so that, but thing is like, I'd say TPU is sort of like kind of like well taking that a little bit further, but still using very much the same manufacturing techniques, everything else like that. And certainly we're seeing this pattern of like, yes, we need to make specialized hardware if we want to improve it, we want to make it more efficient, whatever. So I find this very cool because I think that that's we we've gotten so much off of just taking literally a GPU which was never intended for it and said, well, let's use this for solving you know deep learning, and it worked really good. And when you start moving towards specialized hardware, who knows? Yeah. I mean, if you think about what a graphics card did just broadly for computing, for gaming, think about an, an AI card, That's much like you would have a sound card or just, you know, or, gra or a graphics dis a driver, uh, you know, I, it is not crazy to, cause I know in, in gaming right now, what you're seeing the advancement in GPUs is towards ray tracing and ray tracing chips, chips that are designed to do the math specifically for ray tracing. That will be the, that is my stake in the ground for the future absolutely an ai or an ml chip in the same way would be would be amazing uh i want to say it was 15 or 17 years ago the physics chip um uh, the, that's right its own chip 
right? Yeah. Like like the the idea of having a physics engine chip whose only job was to and at some point in your video game simulation whatever there's going to be a lot of jeep drops that are going to be bouncing all over the place and you need a dedicated card to handle that. They're mostly going to look like this, so we're going to build this so that it does that math uh, very quickly, specifically. Yeah, uh, uh, whatever right. happened to that? <laughs> well, I think that processing got built in. I, it became, uh, my guess would be that it is obsolete, right? Like, yeah, like anything a GPU is today can do vector line rendering can do sound car that's why you don't really see sound cards because all that stuff has gotten miniaturized and fits in the motherboard on the from, chip but yeah. yeah even on the chip like if you look at if you look at like an iphone chip wafer you'll see there's like six chips there you know which is sort of the amazing part and so yeah a lot of that just got put right on there uh plus also there's the um uh, fortuitous fact that our ears Boy, what a narrow range of things we can even hear. <laughs> it's like uh, now th we live in an age where computing processor power is so large that it's like, oh, wait, you want sound too? Um, uh, yeah, okay, yeah. done. It's done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, like, it, like I have my AirPods in right now, and you think about how sophisticated the sound processing is in these. And, you know, to sort of show somebody, you know, 20 years ago and be like, yeah, that, that like I can do background noise reduction in something that you could swallow, which I don't recommend. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't, I don't, I don't want to hear what's going on down there. Um, a few more uh, stories here. This one was from uh, Jedi KV in, uh, in our discord. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, Brian and Andrew, you might know a little bit about this, but a, a black hat, uh, happened, uh, last week, I believe the, uh, uh oh, oh, that's the pre-conference right before DEF CON. Yes, in, yeah. in Las Vegas. Uh, uh, this is from, from the register, but uh, uh, one of the things that they showed off uh, there was uh, a researcher from KU uh, Leuven University in Belgium. Uh, he went on stage and uh, hacked a Starlink user terminal. Uh, the uh, the uh, was able to get root access and, and uh, kind of... Uh, I, well, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't necessarily say good. Good hacking, definitely going through proper channels, and uh, it certainly seems like Starlink understands that this was something that that, that he was doing. But is is this roughly the equivalent of uh, of uh, somebody who climbed up a pole and got free cable, basically, or um, not even free cable? More like was able to open up the cable box and send you know, find look at the IP switching and basically talk to the server directly but not be able to do any kind of as far as we know exploit on the system itself right yes uh, to, to to be specific um uh here, here this is from some of the the registers reporting first he compromised the black box system using voltage fault injection during the execution of the system on chip rom bootloader which allowed him to bypass the firmware signature verification and run his own custom code on the terminal that was in a lab setting um and is, is since built a mod chip uh, that can get root access to the user terminal, which I'm assuming is a device that goes in the house um, w that is using Starlink. So this, uh, yeah, this is like, this is hacking your router. They figured out how to hack your router and your router is made by Tesla or space like Starlink, what have you. Right. Yeah. Um, and so this is the beginning. This is opening the door to, well, what, what can you do? And 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 uh, uh, along the way, Starlink uh, knew that that uh, this researcher was doing this, offered some amount of help uh, because if they discover security vulnerabilities, then uh, it would be better to be <laughs> on their side than not. Um, but uh, it's interesting thinking about Starlink as a hardware and telecom manufacturer to the point that it is a big deal that they get hacked, that they get hacked custom firmware well it, especially in the context that uh part of you know uh, the excitement that is fueling uh starlink is based on the idea that here's an isp that uh has no interest in what country you're in where you are on the planet it's truly direct access to the internet and so on uh but if at a local level 
uh, security protocols could be subverted, that would be not great news. Yeah. Yes. Um, one, one of the uh, other things that they bring up, uh, this was a quote, you could also try to repurpose user terminals. So maybe you could use two user terminals to implement point-to-point -point communications or something like that. So, so much like that, you could... Uh, depending on, and it's all about context and the environment here, but you could possibly in a future use your Starlink satellite ISP to connect to another dish or another user without going through all of the tunnels that you would pay to use. Uh, that one, that one hits me in a weird spot, spot because like I was very sympathetic for, uh, remember QCAT, the, um, uh, little mouse-like yeah. device <laughs> oh where they, they gave away just millions and millions of dollars of these for free in the newspaper. And then they got very upset when people were like, oh, a commercial gizmo for a service I don't want. Let me see what I could do with this. And then they repurposed it in all kinds of crazy ways. Uh, if mm -hmm. you're out in rural America uh, then yeah, go ahead and get your hands on a couple of these Starlink devices, figure out a way where technically you're, you know, I don't know, a hundred miles North, but it appears as though you're a hundred miles South. I, 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 I don't know how I feel about it. I mean, yeah, you're probably violating some terms of service, but that's about it. Well, you're right? stealing service. You're stealing service though. It's like the QCAT was, they literally sent you something into your, to you, you would never ask for. There's this, there's a piece of hardware. Oh, and mm -hmm. you can't do this, this, this. Was like, I'm sorry, I never, never even bought this. <laughs> you know, I never paid for this. Yeah. And I think there was a lawsuit over that that they tried. If I remember correctly, they tried, and they're like, the government was like, they're like, yeah, no, you just sent these to people. You can't, you know, try to. I could be hallucinating the whole thing. But here, the the challenge is that if you're if you're saying, if you were able to, and you can't, but if you were able to use this to get extra service or different tier of service ads theft you know you're you're literally depriving people of you know I, a miserable thing of a resource that takes energy etc yeah uh, and and so. this is this is all hypothetical right now this is root access and custom code but who knows i mean i i uh, this is this is bringing hacking into space i don't know what goes on up there <laughs> so um one last to hear folks bryce does not know what's going on in space i don't know i don't have my finger on the space pulse oh, although i will uh, offer my biggest fear is not of somebody uh, uh, stealing service. It is of a mole that has access to talk to other nodes that could uh, eventually hypothetically DDoS like the world's internet solution at some point. That that does terrify me. Yeah, and and the fact that Starlink is involved in this research. Like doc, uh, Dr. Chiron in our chat mentioned, Starlink has implemented some of the lessons from this researcher's hacking. So this is, uh, you know, the, we, we are kind of, you know, ah, what if they take over the satellites? But also, like, this would be the thing that would happen to make that not happen, <laughs> is researchers figuring out what the limits of these things are. Yeah, it, that serves a purpose, this kind of penetration testing, people trying to figure out what's going on, like, done responsibly serves a valuable. And, and you know, SpaceX and Tesla have recognized this. You know, they've been pretty open to people that because some people are like, ah, we will hide from them and they won't find out our flaws. It's like, that's just not the world. Yeah. Uh, uh, one last, and this is kind of an, a more open conversation, uh, I, I, I would say, just for the end of the show here. Um, uh, there's an article actually on the conversation website called uh, Today's Google Outage Was Brief But Disconcerting. This is from about a week ago. Uh, Google was down for a while. Uh uh, I don't even know when, how long this was, maybe a, an hour, a few hours. Um, we don't really know why. Google doesn't really ever say why. Google goes down sometimes and they don't say why. They don't really have to. But how do we, how do we feel about that? Because especially when something like Google or Amazon or Cloudflare go down, we, we realize how many strings all of these things are connected to and how many, uh, uh, how many tent poles are, are, are involved. You know, if you have, Google can be a very strong part of your life. Search, YouTube, TV, internet access, phone access, the buying things, listening to things, you know, mobile device. If Google goes down, people have a lot of, of, 
of of time and spent. But the same for Amazon. Amazon Web Services power even more things. Um, so how do we feel about any of this? I I would love to hear Andrew go first on this. <laughs> I'm not a fan of when things break. <laughs> Bold Controversial. Take. Bold take. I, I will go out of the limb that? for this. I, I, I would say that. not pay patron Joe Biden. <laughs> yeah, I, you're talking to a person who uses, I believe I use Bing on my phone for search. You know, so I switched over to Bing. Yep. I'm very happy with it. And uh, I, I do, like, I use Gmail for everything. Like, Gmail's my default thing. You know, heaven forbid I ever run afoul of Google and they decide to shut down. That, I would be, might as well just declare me dead the moment I lose my Gmail account. Like, nah, Andrew, well, I don't know if it doesn't exist anymore. But yeah. that concerns me. Which is me, terrifying! But... Imagine! You just said that they could do this. That's incredible. But that's yeah, a new development, my, my... right? This is not the, the past. Well, there's been versions of this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, this is this is the thing. This is this is the bargain, and it's like, well, I could have it through your own domain. But great that I pay another third party to make sure that my domain is up to date, and somebody doesn't go in and you know fabricate. Like every I get every few weeks, I'll get like, hey, there's a domain transfer trying to take place for this domain. Did you authorize this? I'm like, nope. Um, so I I I think vigilance is helpful. I think that you know diversifying where you can using other things. Uh, I have an iPhone. I also periodically buy Androids. I have the latest Pixel phone, which uh, this design is not ergonomically friendly. This is literally like an ice scraper on the back of this. It is like just so hard. You just feel like, oh, I'll just get the ice off my window <laughs> here. But um, other, than, other than that horrible design flaw, uh, I, I try to support alternatives because I like living in a world of choice. Uh, so as a consumer, I support that. I'm thrilled that you and I both had the same impulse. For me, it's uh, DuckDuckGo. I use that as my default search engine for everything. And it's only after I don't get whatever it is I'm looking for that I'll, Ugh, okay, here we go, Google, and I'll give it a try. So so weirdly, I, I did not notice it at all. But Bryce, you, you've mm. always struck me as somebody who is perfectly comfortable with the curated experience. Um, did, did this affect your interaction with Google? I mean, it, it, it's all about what, uh, I, I think it's degrees, right? I do use Google search cause, uh, you know, use it's them the best it's, and it works. It's fast. And I, yeah. Um, uh, I, I think I've talked, maybe, maybe this was done after things, but like, I don't use, I try not to use G Gmail anymore. I have an account that, that we still, that I still use, but that all gets forwarded to, uh, my Hey email. Cause that's that's you know x y and z reasons um so so on that front it didn't it, it didn't um i didn't notice uh i must not have just needed to search anything through because through those hours that it was down um at the same time if youtube was down for an extended period of time that would affect just my daily routine i watch a lot of youtube i watch a lot of youtube um and so it would be very weird. It would be like if Netflix was down in that sense. It's something that I pay for, something that I use and it brought into my my routine of life. Um, and so I would, uh, like Andrew says, I don't like things that are broken. I don't think anyone does. Um, and also I would move on. Like also I would, like that because I don't have the Gmail tie, YouTube would be the only thing that if Google disappeared, I would feel like, oh man, then maybe that would be tough to replace. But I've got email somewhere else. I've got social media somewhere else. Uh, search is kind of come on. There are search alternatives. Um, and I think we have a lot more alternatives, certainly than we did, you know, uh, you know, a decade ago. You know, now you've got DuckDuckGo being good. You've got Bing, which is pretty good. Um, you've got more email alternatives. You've got more social media alternatives, you know. Um, imagine if we were talking about this and Google Plus was still around, right? Google can't even keep their social network online. Um, I, 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 yeah. I, I, so it, it, it was a harsh lesson to learn, but like there was a time I had over 1 million Google Plus followers and then Google Plus gone. There was a time I had over 1 million Vine followers, then Vine gone, you know. Uh, I, eventually, I assume Twitter will fold, and that'll be too bad. 
uh, uh, which brings us back to our advice again and again, <laughs> emails, get them emails. Get the emails. But it, it, it would be, if that happened to a Google, hypothetically, it would be very big. It would be very far reaching. It, it, it would, it would be, I don't know that I would say too big to fail, but it would be such a, if Google failed, someone would ha would surely step in to, to change or take it, um, because it is so involved in every aspect of life. These the tech companies are trying to find ways to work themselves into every part of life, online, offline, and uh, it will be very weird if, I don't know, there's a lot of consolidation, and it will be very weird when a lot of that stops. Who, who do you trust more, uh, Amazon Web Services or Google? Amazon Web Services or Google Web Services? Yeah. Well, I guess Amazon Web Services only because they're better. As a consumer, probably Amazon Web Services only because that's like asking if um if I like Coke or Pepsi. I just drink Pepsi more. Well, and and I guess also. But I don't think about it. We don't think about what web right. services. And, and, and maybe Andrew knows is is the what's the RC cola in this story? Like what's third place? Um, I'm not going to name names. I, I, I'm going to say that, uh, Amazon's been a leader for a while, but everybody kind of hates it because it's just, you know, Amazon is the first. And so if you go through the documentation, it's just confusing and stuff. I would say that other services are trying to do it, but they're spread so thin. So it can be challenging. So other people have stronger opinions than myself. Yeah. So, and, and, you know, the average person doesn't like, choose this you know that's why they run a news article every six months i tried to get google out of my life and here's all of my words about it uh which is is very interesting and i think that's always a very interesting experiment today where there's a lot of um even as there's commoditized tech and commoditized um internet services a lot of them are still built on some of the same uh, uh built on just one, uh, just a handful of, of Similar foundations. Backbone. Yeah. So. Alrighty. Well, uh, those are some of the stories I had. Uh, anybody else? Uh, have anything else happened in the world this week? Yeah, dude. Uh, uh, some of us decided to spend the last 24 hours <laughs> watching all of Westworld. <laughs> and. And. Uh, season four of Westworld, by the way. And I think that. The way we did this, spoiler alert for when we spoil things later, uh, knowing everything in advance made it great. I had a really good time. Uh, Andrew is still watching the show, so I hope you, he doesn't. Want, well, we're not going to talk about any details at all. We, we, we won't. Uh, uh, is it safe? Yes, yeah, it's safe. It's safe. It's it safe. is. It, it is safe. So, Brian, you know my project. What I've been doing. Oh, uh, going back. I've been to going the back. What and so now I'm midway season three, and I'm gonna actually restart season four. So I'm trying to be as blank of a slate as possible. Mm. Uh, you, you know, uh, in preparation for the Westworld finale, I did a little bit of what you just said, Andrew. I watched. I watched like the first half of season one and then I jumped to the finale and then I watched the first and last episodes of season two and great. That's the show is great. Especially if you know what's going on, it feels totally different. It feels like, Oh, I know how you're important. You're supposed to be. Oh, you are way more important than I thought you were supposed to be. Uh, it's cool. Westworld's cool, man. I, I think it's a lot cooler and easier to, to get into if you, know enough of the story in advance and you're told this is an anthology series each season is its own self-contained story they're going to go places um and More or less yeah knowing that and you know riding season four was a blast and also the thing that i pulled out of season one was they did a lot of the heavy stuff that they try to set across or that they set up they don't do, uh, they don't beat you over the head with the answer of it. And you could, if you're not paying attention or if you're not, if you're only like half 
uh, you know, bought in on it, you might miss the answer, right? Like I see you in our chat is joking. The maze is a sled. There is an answer to what is in the middle of the maze, and we find it is definitively told to you multiple times, um, and uh, uh, it's easy to forget that fact because they they also don't lean on stuff too long. So uh, Westworld's good. I like Westworld. Uh, Andrew, do you have a pick? The only thing I've been able to watch has been work, work my way through Westworld. And I, and I will, <laughs> I will reemphasize. I, I've come away with a much deeper appreciation for season one and two as a cohesive narrative. I really enjoyed them. I'm appreciating season three a little bit more as I watch it. Uh, I, I, my crit with it is like, there are some really cool concepts and a really cool vision of the future with a really is this really how it would play out? I mean, I don't know, but I don't know if I buy into it. And this sort of the backstory of, oh yeah, there's one called Insight and it controls your fate. And this is just a thing. It's always been there. And it just feels so, it feels like a different series with a different history. Mm. And I think it could have been done better. And I think that some of the episodes I go like, this probably sounded really cool in script form, but the way this was directed, this is not very cool. Because it's just a lot of like, you know, there's an episode where somebody's experiencing something and they just all they really do is just change the color grading and the music. And I'm like, this doesn't sell this for me. I'm not like into it. And then it's also because I was thinking about like, oh, here's a car chase. The problem is this version of Los Angeles, there's nobody there and it's a few robotic cars. And I'm like, why not have car trains of robotic container vehicles that you're navigating why not make this a more complex dynamic environment so the storytelling is more interesting and then you know yeah. i have thoughts maybe next season maybe they'll do that next season maybe they'll uh get that budget that they need to make a <laughs> yeah, exactly. dollar value yeah. <laughs> I liked it because that's like season three. They're like, hey, what, I'm Aaron Paul. Sure. All right. Have Aaron Paul in it. Cool. <laughs> you know, and Aaron Paul's in there. Yeah. I think he's great. But it's like, yeah, budget wise, like clearly uh, mm. they have money. Uh, I got to pick um, uh, oh. tonight's tonight's the night. Oh, hold your breath. Tonight we get to watch a new episode of Better Call Saul, and it might be the last time we ever get to do that. Oh. Um Better Call Saul is a very good show, very heavy show. They have set up. I we are I we are recording this hours before it premieres. Um, I hope that it I hope that it lands well because they jumped off of a very big ramp at the penultimate episode. Uh, and they made a, some moves. Some moves were made. Yeah, it is a an, a very interesting show. It is a spinoff that I think. It very easily will go down as better than its original. Uh, Breaking Bad's good, but they figured it out during Breaking Bad, and they knew what it was in Better Call Saul. Well, they knew. They knew how to do it in Better Call Saul. So I, I think it's great. Uh, AMC's Better Call Saul. Uh, rip to a real one. So that's my pick. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Any other stuff, guys? No. I'm sorry. I've I got a phone call. It's oh. from the president, but he's not a patron. I mean, I'm, yeah, I don't, think, I don't see him on a Patreon yet. Yeah, sorry. So sorry, Joe. Next time. It's been... How has it been, Andrew? Oh, you, it's your show, too. Oh, it's my... Okay, well, I would say it's been weird. Yay! <laughs> we did it! <laughs> oh, man. All right, good stuff. Well, uh, do we got a little after things in us? Yeah, I, I, uh, I. You gotta go do a thing. Well, I have a hard out like before one, so I wanted to push it to next week. Okay. Yeah, so, we'll do that. Okay. Yeah, that okay. that would make things simple for me. Yeah. All right. Well, then uh, we will be back, everybody, with uh, some cord killers, Brian, Tom, Merritt, and myself, uh, killing all your cords in a few hours here. Thank you for joining us. We'll be back. Another time, bye. I love you.